Can you imagine getting fired from Baskin Robbins for eating too much ice cream? Does anyone else hold that honor? You know, I always thought having product knowledge was an asset. But certainly the management thought my assets had too much product knowledge. I mean, who knew? I was 16 years old. I'm living in a small town, Aberdeen, Washington. And I didn't realize that they had controls over their product with weight scales. So the ice cream was on weights. And as the ice cream weight went, you know, there was less weight, there should be money in the till to match the weight of the ice cream. Who knew? So I'm what's called two-legged clutter. I was actually fired. And I went over to Bas uh, McDonald's. Because I figured, I wonder if they have a weight scale on those French fries. <laughs> so anyway, we're so excited to have you. How many of you flew in today to be here? Raise your hands. Wow. OK, so how many of you had to get up at 4 o'clock to be here? Woo! No wonder you're so quiet. You're exhausted. And how many of you ate before you walked into the room? That means 90% of your energy right now is digesting. Lucky me. So we're going to be talking about clutteronomics. So I have a question for you. How many of you currently right now have an issue with clutter, some type of issue? Raise your hands. Get them up high. Let's get the energy going in this room. OK. Of that, how many of you when you first heard the word clutter, thought about it in the context of physical clutter? Raise your hand. How many of you thought about something else besides physical clutter before Richard said that? OK, what did you think of, Michael? Email, email clutter, right? Who's got email clutter? I think everybody in the room should have a hand up on that. Um, what else? Who else thought of something? Did you think of something? Oh, you're, <laughs> what is your name? What's, What's your name? Yeah. Becky, you are hysterical. See, I'm only as funny as you guys are. So if you throw things back at me, we're going to have a really good time, or we're going to be here for two and a half really long hours. So Becky, this is a button that says, I'm so excited to ask me, why are you single? Why are you single? No, are you single? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, that's a different seminar. Oh, we're so happy, Beth. Everybody's happy for Beth. Give it a round up. She has space cleared the opportunity to be single, and now she's currently in a relationship. I was just going to say, wear the button, but be careful when you wear it. I'm so excited. Ask me why. So tell me this. On a scale of 1 to 10, and this is not scientific by any stretch of the imagination, um, with 10 being the worst, now we're talking about physical clutter. Because the majority of people, 90% of people, when they think of clutter, they think physical. But as Richard mentioned, and what we're going to talk about today, is I'm going to expand your thinking about what clutter is and where it's hiding and how much it's costing you. So on a scale of 1 to 10, with 10 being the worst, now, what would you say your number is? How many of you have clutter issues with physical clutter, just 1 to 5? 1 to 5ers. Look at them. They're so proud. Yeah. I'm a one to fiver. OK, who is the six to teners? OK, we have a bar in the back of the room. <laughs> six to teners. OK, you know who you are. OK, great. So the next question is, and this is interesting. I've traveled the country, and I asked this question. And very rarely do ever hands go up. Now, how many of you working in your environments, whether it's a personal situation or in the context of business, whether it's in business planning or otherwise. How many of you have ever had a discussion, ever, about what your clutter is actually costing your organization? Look at the room. Wow. I am so excited to be here. You know I'm like a kid at Christmas. I'm like a little puppy because I get so excited. I'm like so excited I have to calm myself down. Because I have been a business consultant for over 20 years. I'm a strategist. I grew up in a family where my father was in motivation. I was raised on Zig Ziglar and Dennis Waitley and Robert Schuler. I trained with Tony Robbins for five years. I'm a mind chiropractor. I adjust people's limiting thinking. 
So I'm always looking at strategies. I am always looking for the easiest, fastest way to get a solution for the person that I'm working with or the organization. This is that strategy. Now, my intention today, we have a very short window. I am going to try to give you as much information without overwhelming you in a short amount of time to get you interested and hooked on Clutternomics. That's my goal. I want you to be inspired to really look at this, this thing called Clutternomics. Now, some of you in this room are already using these strategies, but you don't frame them in a sense of Clutternomics. But the reason my companies can grow 20 to 50%, whether it be in budgets, membership, attendees, what have you, it all starts here with these little basics that I am going to share with you today. So that's my intention, is to talk about clutter in a way that you may never even imagined, to really point out in a very short window what your clutter is costing you. It is my intention to have you look at this and implement this on a daily basis, weekly basis, monthly basis, yearly basis as part of your new incentives and objectives. Are you with me? Say yes. Woohoo! Okay. I, I need a nap now. <laughs> it's quite an opening. Now, before Clutternomics, tell me, how many of you know someone who works in this environment? Raise your hands. Raise them up high. You know, you know. Okay. Now keep your hands up for a minute. You know somebody that works like this? Okay. How many of you know that person intimately? Keep your hands up. Look at all the honest people. Okay. This is the next question. How many of you don't have any relations to this? You don't work like this. Your desk doesn't look like this. You don't have an issue with physical clutter. Okay, raise your, good. I met Michael yesterday. He's an amazing brain type. They have a certain brain type. We're going to be talking about that. Keep those hands up. Now, Richard, are you lying? <laughs> so look how, now keep them up. Look how, what small percentage actually gets to work. In, in an environment that looks more like this. Is this what you're thinking about? Right. Okay. <laughs> you're hysterical. What's your name? Bob? Oh, I love that your name's Bob. My dad is Bob, and he's in heaven now. And um, he comes to me with pennies, and he sent me eight pennies the other day, and here he is. There you go. It's a lollipop. It won't be clutter because you're going to eat it and then it will be gone. So if we think of before Clutternomics, we're gonna go through this entire thing. We're gonna, I'm gonna show you today why this is not healthy for you or your organization or the person that's working within this. Certainly as we discussed, clutter is way beyond physical, so we're gonna go way beyond the desk, we're gonna look at the mess, we're gonna look at two things today. We're going to look at clutter as a business consultant, I go in and I look at what the organizational clutter is, and I look at what the personal clutter is. Are you with me? The first place we start with any organization is at the desk, here. That's where we start, because this is a goal. If you choose to get hooked on Clutternomics, if you choose to spend 15 minutes a day, if you want, my clients do one hour a week. That's it. No overwhelm. It's just the intention of one hour a week, 15 minutes a day, and it's consistent effort over time. Are you with me? How many of you live with somebody that may be a hoarder? Oh, now see, she has, she, my guess is that you're highly organized. Is that my guess? And you've married a man that is challenged with clutter. Well, it's my roommate. Your roommate. <laughs> So you haven't married him yet? It's a girl. It's a girl. OK. <laughs> so this is a roommate, all right? And so you didn't know about this, so you couldn't interview for the perfect right roommate before she arrived. So she arrived, and she brought her tendencies with her. Is that correct? Um, we've been friends for a very long time, but I didn't live with her until recently, and it was recently discovered. 
recently discovered. See, now in the next time, you're going to take this information, you're going to do an informational interview, and you're going to make sure that no one else will come into your space because I'm going to teach you how to identify them before they move in. <laughs> now, what's interesting is how many of you at an office will walk by somebody's office and have judgment about this? Raise your hand if you're honest. Okay, what are some of the judgments that you're thinking as you walk by? Um, the gal in the white, what is your name? Hi, Miss Danya. What's your judgment? They don't have discipline, okay? Is somebody writing this down? They don't have discipline. What's another judgment? Yes, sir. How can they get anything done? What else? What else we got? He gets concerned that they're going to miss deadlines. Are you in management? Uh, Do you own? Somewhat, yeah. somewhat. What else? What's another judgment? Unorganized. Who is that, Bob again? Todd, you said unorganized. What other judgments do we have? Overwhelmed. What else we got? Anything else? Lazy, undisciplined, pigs, slobs. We're going to talk about this a little later, but I'm going to make this point right now. See, in my world as a mind chiropractor, what happens in the mind is you walk into any situation, you have a story. So you've made up a story about this picture, right? The problem is none of it's true. So you have put that person in a box. You have labeled them as undisciplined, lazy, unorganized, could miss something, not attentive, careless. So you've made up a story about them based on a physical outpicturing of their reality called their desk. Are you with me still? None of it's true. What we need to talk about, and we'll talk about it again, is that you must have a compassion for these people that work like this. Because what you're going to find out today is we're going to talk about a few brain types. It is based on your brain type is the way you function primarily in the world. If you see a desk like this, people are in pain. They are dealing with ADD, ADHD, which is not a bad thing. I'm an ADD kid. It took me eight years to sustain a system. Eight years. I talked to a gal the other day who said that she's so embarrassed that she was going to get found out that her out world was fine, but she said if they opened up my drawers, they would fire me. She had so much shame and so much guilt and so much embarrassment. People are carrying that with them. So if you take nothing else, please remove the judgment. We must begin there to space clear the judgment of people and their stuff. They're truly doing the best they can with the resources they have. I'm going to give you a lot of resources that you can support yourselves and your friends. But this is the goal. I promise you, one hour a week over a year, you absolutely, with consistent effort, and those of you that need support will get it. Right? This is the goal. This is what we're talking about today. Can we hold your question until later, Bob, or do you want to address it right now? Comment? Yes. 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 Brilliant. Yes. 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 But it's a, a lot of them are. Yeah. Yes. Right. If they, if they can function. And there are studies, there's some studies in my resource that absolutely when there's clutter, that there's a neuroscience study that shows that it takes away from your focus and your ability to um, um, take in information. So there are studies that speak to what you're talking about. So the key thing is there, if they can function. And how would they function better, a little bit better? They don't have to get to this. You know, because 
My desk, I'm a visual person. You might walk in and say I'm cluttered, but I'm visual. I need to see it. If I don't see it, how many of you need to see your stuff? And if you don't see it, you forget about it, right? So, you know, it's different for everyone to your point, Bob. It's different to everybody. So let's move on. Okay, we're gonna move on. Here we go. Why does this work? People say, if, have you ever been in between successes? Out of a job, laid off, fired, okay. Well, I, I speak to a lot of organizations that people are in between successes. And I say, the first thing I said, you want a job? Do some space clearing. Get to decluttering. Because this is the deal. Why does it work? Why can I grow company profits 20 to 50%? Because people get hooked on clutteronomics. That's why. They start clearing things. The universe abhors a vacuum. If you want something new, you need to open up the space. Does that make sense with everybody without going into quantum physics and why it works? Does that make sense? Think of it like your voicemail. If your voicemail, and I know you guys are spinning more plates in a Chinese circus and you're at warp speed with your hair on fire. I worked in your industry. I worked for a company we produced for Apple, IBM, Digital, and Kodak, and I didn't say I was an event planner. I said I was a firefighter. Every day there was a different fire of just what to go in and what to do, so I understand the world completely. But it's like your voicemail. If your voicemail is full, can you get any more new messages? The answer, everybody, would be a collective no. Go ahead. Okay, good. We're filming today, so they want to see that you actually have a pulse and you're interactive and you're listening. Good. Okay. So, no. So the same thing works with clutter. If every crevice, if every drawer, if every cupboard, if every file is stuffed, you have just communicated, I need nothing. I need nothing new. Does that make sense? So if you want something new, open up a space. Really simple. Want something, it works for a lot of things. All right, let's look at the definition of clutter. The word clutter derives from the middle, middle English word cloiter, which means to coagulate, and that's about as stuck as you can get. Clutter accumulates when energy stagnates, and likewise, energy stagnates when clutter accumulates. I got this book some 25 years ago. It's Karen Kingston's book. It's called Clear Your Clutter with Feng Shui. Very woo-woo, sounds a little bit LA, but trust me, I'm not the feng shui specialist. And it's free yourself from physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual clutter forever. This particular book changed my life right here and tens of thousands of my clients and audiences' lives. Honest to goodness, it's like the best medicine there is, best strategy. So to go on, this is the definition that comes from this particular book. So the clutter begins as a symptom of what is happening with you in your life and then becomes a part of the problem itself because the more of it you have, the more stagnant, energy attracts to itself. How many of you walk into a room that's cluttered and you can feel it in your body? You can just feel it. How many of you does it give a knot in your stomach when you walk into that room? How many of you really it starts to choke here in your throat? Anybody experience that? How many of you get repulsed when you walk into a room with clutter and it's just like Great, a few of you. I hope you're married to somebody who's just like you. <laughs> I've seen quite a few divorces of those that weren't. Trust me, we've cleared away some husbands. and wives. <laughs> yeah, It's a little space clearing we've done. I did a year-long boot camp uh, with Declutter and had nine guest experts. And So anyway, it's amazing what people will start clearing. Um, so let's look at what's physical clutter so we're all on the same page. Now this is physical clutter. Number one, things that you do not use or love. Do you have anything in your life currently, whether at home or the office, that you do not use or love? Raise your hand. Say yes, look at that. Woo! So we're going to have a, so much fun going home. What is physical clutter according to Karen Kingston? Things that are untidy or disorganized. Raise your hand if you're in that group. Aren't you so glad that I'm here? This is exciting. Too many things in too small of a space. Who's that? Raise your hand. OK. How about this one? Anything unfinished? Anybody like that? Oh, and I forgot to tell you, all the handouts are here in the middle of the table. We just didn't want you looking ahead of time. 
So um, grab a handout, everybody. Thanks, Rich. Okay, rock and roll. So that's physical um, clutter. Any question on physical clutter? Okay, we're really clear on that. What is clutter? Now, this is me. Clutter is a healing opportunity. Now, I really want to bang this point home. Clutter is not just clutter. I'm of the belief that everything in our life is there to teach us. Would you agree, some of you? That everything, including cancer, heart attacks, everything is a teacher, would you agree? I've had cancer twice, it's been a great teacher. Right? So, clutter is the same thing. If it is an outpicturing of something that's going on within you, there's a healing opportunity. The only way the clutter is going to disappear, not be an issue, is if you choose to do the work over time addressing the core issue of what started the clutter. Are you with me? So, how many of you have ever, and, and we did this poll, have you ever felt inside your gut, you have clutter and you hate your clutter? You've been thinking about clearing it for more than a year. You hate it, you despise it, it disgusts you, it makes you feel less than. You feel like you're undisciplined. Why in the hell do I have all this crap? Have you felt that over a year's time? Raise your hand. Okay, look at all those numbers. Now, I want you to make your clutter your new BFF, your new best friend. This is the deal and this is how it works with everything. This is a law. Whatever you resist, persist. Have you heard that before? Whatever you resist, whatever you push against, persist, and it will expand. So in order for you to start mitigating the clutter, clearing the clutter, to experience all of those benefits that you saw on the video, all of the freedom and the abundance and the peace of mind and the clarity and the higher productivity and all of that, it must be your best friend. You must look at that clutter and go, oh my God, I love you. I just love you. I love you so much, and what are you trying to teach me? It's not the bad, it's not bad. It's not right or wrong, it just is. Drop the judgment, number one. Drop the judgment, make friends with your clutter, and now you can begin the process of clearing. Does that make sense? Raise your hand. Yes or yes, thank you. Okay, that's a really important point right there. If you make that distinction, if you do that flip within yourself, you'll have a lot more fun. Then it becomes fun. It's really fun. I love it. I love it so much that I used to be, I'm the ADD girl. It took me eight years to get to maintenance, to just to get to where things would actually go in their little place. And Sometimes I'd rather clear than anything else because you get so high on the feelings. <laughs> and then I have to work with clients to talk them off the tree. Like, you can't be clearing during work time. You know, it's after the work time, right? Because they get so excited about it. Because the benefits are so addicting. All right. Now, again, as a business consultant, I said two things at the beginning. I look at organizational clutter. I look at personal clutter. This is my definition of business clutter. Business clutter is any issue or challenge you have with your organization. Now, many of you have first, you know, you'll start off at the first of the year, you look at your goals and objectives, you look at what's not working, and you try to create solutions, correct? Right? For your shows, for your members, for the board, for all of it. This is what I do, and this is a strategy, so if any of you are in that position to launch new strategies within your organizations is this. I was working at SMG. We were producing shows for Apple Digital Kodak, blah, blah, I told you. We had eight employees, just an office of eight. And what I did is I had all the coworkers, because I saw all of this stuff happening, all these issues and challenges, within just in the internal organization. Right? This is not talking about everything else that we got to deal with on the outside with our clients. This is just internally. And I had each of the workers come to me in a meeting, and they had, a, they had an objective. They were going to give me, what is your issues, and what's your solution? 
so it just wasn't come and complain. They had to present as an employee what they felt the issue was and what they felt the solution was. Do you know we had over 340 some issues with eight people? That's a lot. That's a lot of clutter. Can you imagine what's happening to the organization, all the breakdowns and what's happening with the work when you have that many issues just with eight people working internally? There's a lot of clutter, wouldn't you say, right? Isn't it some of your teammates that you work with, you'd like to bless them, release them, and let them prosper elsewhere? Or you, some days you just wish you had a gun. It's like, I mean, I know what it's like to work in a world when there's more than one person in the office. It can be hell some days. So what I did is we went to an offsite, we went to Tahoe, and I took the issues, and I put them in hot, medium, and cold, and I created agreements. And in three hours, we went through what are our issues, and we created agreements. These were working agreements that we as a team were going to focus on. This was the issue, this was the agreement. Are you with me? Now, we were not at Nirvana, but going forward, we were really highly productive. More joy, more peace, more clarity, more creativity, because we got rid of all the internal clutter, the issues and challenges, a lot of it. We addressed a lot of it. For another company, now this is really phenomenal. If you're an owner of a company or a, a, your group and you have this power or you can tell whoever does, another great way to do it is you create a survey and it's anonymous. I did it with 90 employees of a retail store. This was a mom and pop and daughter shop. And I went in and I did an anonymous survey. They had over 500 and some issues. It took me two years but we put them in hot, medium, and cold, and we created solutions for every issue that they had. And we were able to systematically go through, I created eight programs to offset any issues or challenges. It was a cust big customer service deal that I did back in the day. So, these issues can affect you personally, professionally, mentally, physically, abundance-wise, and more. You must have a plan to address this because then you just keep working in the crap and working it, you know, it's just like, it's undaunting, isn't it? It's just like, ugh. Some of you don't even want to go to work because you have to face that person or persons. Or maybe it's you and you just don't know it. That's happened to me before. I was the last to know. <laughs> and it was me. <laughs> it's like, whoa. <laughs> you know? Yeah, sometimes we don't know. So, now you have my strategy. This is what I do, and it's very easy to implement. You take your top issues and create solutions. Very simple strategy. I typically do it at the beginning of the year, and then I work on it throughout the year. Now, let's look at some clutter cost. The economics, clutternomics, the economics of clutter. Some of these facts may blow your minds, literally. Now, I know you're not corporations, but just think in terms of what you're doing. In the study of Brother International U.S., corporations lose $177 billion, billion annually due to clutter. I bet your minds are scrambling. Like, really? Who would even have guessed it was that much? This is the cost of your clutter, people. This is why it's so important to integrate it. Stephanie Winston, author of The Organized Executive, estimates that an hour a day is lost to disorder. On average... Now, if you're an owner of a company and all of your employees that you're paying to be highly productive spend an hour a day looking for something, there is a high cost to that business, that organization, that association, high cost. You're losing $8,000 per employee every single year that's earning approximately 65,000 a year. If you have 30 employees, the organization is losing $240,000 a year. Can you say $240,000 a year? Carl, can you say $240,000 a year? Yes. 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 That's a lot of leakage that you may not even considered or even thought about. That's a cost. 
All right, let's look at this one. Now, in our business, if you have an ADD brain, ADHD brain, brain bipolar, depressed, <clears throat> and you're not on your meds, it's very easy to misplace laptops, iPads, cell phones, adapters, chargers, office supplies. Now, how many of you currently have a system to find all these things if they get lost? Because it's clutter, it's an issue. Is it an issue with any of your organizations? We're getting a yes right here. Anyone else? Yes there? In the back, that's a yes for you guys. Do you have a solution to track these things? Of course, with Apple, you have, you, the, the, there's that Finder software that you can find it. I'm not sure about the Android. Can you find those? Is there a clapper attached to any of them? So that's an issue. But let's look at office supplies. What we need to clear there is a belief system. Now, this may be you, and don't feel bad about it, because it's OK. It used to be me until I worked at Nordstrom's. I opened up Nordstrom's Valley Fair 30 years ago. I was personal touch manager. I did all the customer service training. I was there for a while before I moved on to Apple Computer. And I felt entitled to the office supplies. Anyone else? No, not very many honest people in the audience at this moment. So I thought, well, I could use their phone to make long distance calls. We didn't have cell phones in the day, and I was trying to save on my little budget. So I'd use their phone. I'd take their yellow pads. I'd take their pins. Then Nordstrom's implemented their 401k policy, and they got the employees on board. And what they did is coming in security and out of security, they would label the products, the tissue, the ribbons, the tape, the pens. They put a price on them. And then you would, you would before you left security, <laughs> leave the pens. <laughs> because it was cutting into your profit sharing, so they got us on board that way. Because literally for companies and associations, they're losing, that's a big issue. They're losing a lot to employees who entitle themselves to the copy machine, the phones, and all the supplies. And I will tell you this. Whether you take a pen or a yellow pad or you take a million dollars, it is the act of stealing. It's not yours. So what you need to clear is your belief or entitlement about those supplies. Right? So you want to shift your thinking there. Because in the world, it's still the concept of stealing. So as soon as that was pointed out to me, I'm a recovering Catholic at the moment. you know. But at the time, I had a lot of guilt and shame. <laughs> I was just like, oh, I don't want to be that girl. I stole money when I was in the cloakroom in sixth grade. Isn't that terrible? Lunch money? It was awful. I think I lifted some candy at the penny candy store. <laughs> this was in my pocket. Oh. So I understand. When you have this entitlement thing, and it's just, oh, it's just a pen. It's just some paper. So look at that. That's another clutter issue. All right, this is interesting. Two-legged clutter. Has anyone referred to their friends that, or the people that they work with that they really can't stand as two-legged clutter? <laughs> What's a nice way to think about it? How many of you know people that are two-legged clutter in your organization? How many of you have members, and you're run by members, so you really can't let them, you know, bless them, release them, and let them prosper elsewhere? Because, you know, you really want their, you know, their revenue streams and their participation. But how many of you have people that you would like to get rid of? Two-legged clutter, right? Okay. Now, I will just briefly go over this, but if you are, how many of you are in a hiring position right now? Raise your hands. Raise them up good. Okay. So we'll touch on this. The cost of hiring employees. Now, I made a mistake on this slide. I'm going to tell you what happened. Um, when I work with my clients, um, one of the biggest things that I do when I go in and help them hire and is looking at, from my perspective, I'm looking at, OK, I'm looking at their skill set. That's secondary. I'm looking at their beliefs, their values. I'm looking at what's important. Like I have a business owner that's in this field in Ohio. He's a design firm. And he wanted to replace himself. He's out on a three-month sabbatical now, and it's nice. But we hired, we duplicated him. So in order to do that, 
I needed to duplicate John. So what are his talents, his skills, what are his beliefs, what is his values? I said, John, what's important to you? What are those intangibles? You know, from customer service to caring to a humanitarian heart to these types of things. And I created questions because that question when you're hiring, what are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? Somebody asked me that and I was interviewing in the president's office. I'm in the president's office at Apple Computer. I worked for John Scully for a minute. My first temp job was with John Scully. And so now I'm in the office of the uh, president of Apple Pacific and uh, my boss, John Santler, comes over, you know, the gentleman that produces shows, and he said to me, so he said, Kathleen, what's a, what's a weakness of yours? And I'm thinking, in my mind, I'm thinking, well, geez, I'm not going to tell him I can't spell worth crap. I'm not going to tell him my grammar sucks. Because I had five people that were really good at grammar in the president's office, and if he said something, I'd write it down. I didn't understand half of what he was saying or the words, and I kind of put it like this, and I'd send it out to my friends that were really great writers. And then, because I'm a great connector, I can always figure out a solution. And then we'd come back, and then I'd walk in, and he'd sign it, and it'd be fabulous. So I said, if I tell him I can't spell and my grammar sucks, I'm not going to get the job. So I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I'm thinking. I go, oh, I have something. He goes, what is it? I said, sometimes I overeat. <laughs> and then I called Joan, who actually worked for the president. She was on a nine-week sabbatical. And I said, Joni, I said, if I'm going to go through this interview process, I need a weakness that I can discuss. I said, do you have one for me? You know me. What's my weakness? And she goes, sometimes you're loud. I go, loud? Well, that's just a volume thing. That's really not a weakness. Not as a cheerleader, it's not a weakness. But the first day in that office, he said, is she always this loud? And then I had to put shush on my phone, literally a shush. And then people would call in and ask if I had the flu. You know, because I'm like, thank you for calling. <laughs> See, my voice was volume, clutter. So two-legged clutter, the most expensive thing is hiring people. Write this book down if you ever had to hire people or you're attracting clients. Attracting the perfect customers, the power of strategic synchronicity. Attracting Perfect Customers, The Power of Strategic Syn Synchronicity by Stacy Hall, it's Stacy with an E, and Jan, B-R-O-G-N-I-E-Z, Jan, B-R-O-G-N-I-E-Z. So, I interviewed for John and I found him the perfect match. But the way I interview is I ask questions, because I'm a mind chiropractor, I'm looking at people's belief systems. Zappos does this really well. We're going to talk about it a little bit on the brand here in a slide coming up. But they hire brand specialists. Southwest hires personality first. You've got to be a people person, and if you're funny, all the better. But this is a huge cost to companies. Now, Horgan put this together, two-legged... Uh, cost for employees, the hiring cost, total compensation, cost of maintaining the employee, disruptive cost, severance, mistakes, failures, and missed business opportunities. This is the cost. Equals now. I thought it was $84,000. I thought that was huge. But then I reread my notes a couple days ago when I was re preparing, and it's based on a mid level management making $62K a year that works for the company 2.5 years. This is in your handouts, you can go read this. It's not 84,000, it's 840,000. That's my mistake. My brain, when I read it, didn't even conceive that doing a wrong hire that's with your company for 2.5 years would cost you $840,000. He talks about bringing some, an executive on runs about $240,000, depending on how big your company is. So that's just, that's just a clutter cost that I wanted you to be aware of. Now, certainly, a lot of you can downsize that and make it relevant to where you're at and what you're working with based on what you guys do. Now, look at this. When people suck the life out of you, wouldn't it be nice if they took some fat, too? <laughs> Another big personal thing that I say if you worked at my company, I would have a policy, leave your drama at the door. Leave your drama at the door. Don't bring your drama into the building. It is clutter. 
People with bad attitudes. How many of you work with people with bad attitudes? How many of you work with people, you know, their lips are wrapped around their ankles most of the time? Or if you ask them how you're doing, they're going to tell you. <laughs> and then they tell you, 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 and you're laughing. And some of them are sitting at your table. <laughs> right? Keep your words sweet. You may have to eat them. I have a new button. It says, keep your tweets sweet. You may have to eat them. So people in their behaviors have a lot of personality traits that I consider clutter, right? So don't be that. Another two-legged clutter cost is bringing on the wrong board members. How many of you work with boards? OK, interesting. I've done a lot of board training in the past, um, years ago. And it's interesting because this book that I told you about will really help you decide and discern who your perfect right board person would be, who your perfect right member would be, who your perfect right manager would be, who your perfect right, you can use it for everything. But if you understand a board member's qualities and characteristics, what are the qualities and characteristics that make a really great board member? then you're able to discern, decide before they go up for a vote. How many of your board members, you give them to the board and then they vote on an incoming board member? How many work with that strategy? Oh, just one? How are the other board members chosen here? The members. The members vote for them. But who chooses them to be even voted on? You have a nominating committee. So you want your nominating committee to really understand qualities and characteristics before they nominate. This is another thing I do with boards. If you're having a board meeting, the very first thing I do is I gather them all together. Same thing I did with Santler Marketing Group is I look at, OK, as a board, when you guys work together, what are the things that drive you crazy? Because board members, aren't they all volunteer? All volunteer. OK. This is the deal. You get a room of board members in a room. This could be board members. This could be teammates. You can use it for anything. What are your pet peeves when you've been on a board? People that don't return emails within 24 hours, 48 hours, this type. Whatever the pet peeve is, you write it on a sheet of paper. Then you collectively, everybody as a group, creates a solution for the pet peeve. Isn't that so simple? These are the pet peeves. These are our agreements. Those become the working agreements for the entire year. Are you with me? Any questions on that? It's so simple. And this is the other thing that I teach when I'm working with boards. There's two different belief systems that happen on boards. One, you have the board member who believes it's a volunteer job, and they treat it as such, and they have a belief that they'll get to it when they get to it because they're not being paid. Do you know those boards? You know them. Then there's the board member, and it starts with the belief system. This is why I check in with the belief first before a board member is submitted to be voted on. I would ask that person, what is your belief about a board? If that person says, when I show up to a board, I work as if I am getting paid. I do the exact same thing. Does that make sense? As if I'm getting paid. That's the belief system that you want to start with to have a successful board. If everybody on the board is on board with that belief system, fantastic. Make sense? Really simple strategy to keep the clutter down on boards. But it's very costly to have the wrong boards. I you know, was interviewing for this particular thing, and I called out to a lot of my friends that work at associations. And one was in Seattle, and uh, she works with the Association of Restaurateurs. And she goes, you know what? They are really great at running a restaurant. But what happens is they don't really know how to run an association. Would you agree? Two different things. So board members are critical, and they can be two-legged two clutter. The other thing is, what is the cost of a damaged brand? When I was working with Richard Anderson, I was going through all these different personality things that might happen at Shepherd that might deplete the brand. And you know what I was so, I'm so glad that you guys get to work with Shepard because you know what, I've adored Richard. 
as a person for years. And I've worked with Shepherd. I opened up at IAEE for their lunch when they used to host that and, and have all the new um, exhibitors come in. And I got to do their final lunch in their sixth year. I spoke at that. But I really didn't understand the depth of who Shepherd really is as, as a, a company and in their value systems. And they, the reason why Shepherd is so good, and I'm not just plugging them, I mean, I told Richard Anderson, I mean, it really moved me. I'm like, thank you for sharing more about your company because you're already doing a lot of the stuff that I have companies do. Do you know they do values training? Did you know that they do values training two or three times a year? Did you know that about Shepherd? Did you know that? That's extraordinary. They also have a Blue Diamond customer service program that they have integrated and everybody goes through. And you know what that means to you if you're working with them? That's like nirvana. That's heaven. So they have done the right things in the background to manage their brand. And this is what I tell companies. I said every single person that works at your organization is a part of your brand. What is your organization? It's the Houston Apartment Association, and you have how many employees? So 23 people that work for the Houston Apartment Association is the brand. Are you clear there? That means that you're not going to your trade show with your name badge, drinking and dancing on tables with your name badge. You're your brand. What is that? You know, and, and the thing of it is, it's like, when I taught customer service, I Nordstromized companies for 20 years. And I would tell them about the internet. People can put up a website about you in a snap. We've got people yelping about you that, do, you know, the slightest little thing could irritate them that day and bang, 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 bang. We have companies sprouting all up just to manage your social media. If you want to mitigate that clutter, you want to ensure that every single person that's working at your association, your group, your your business, that they understand that they are the brand. Wherever they go, they are the brand. They can tweet, they can Facebook, they can LinkedIn, they can social media. Oh my God, some of your workers, have you looked at their Facebook? <laughs> what is that? That is not the brand that you want associated with the people that work with you. So you must do some kind of training like Shepard does, whether it be value training, customer service training, whatever it is. There is so much cost that people can do, and this is the deal. When your customers, your members, are interacting with you, they interact with you on many different levels, but there's what's called an encounter point. Your members encounter you on a plethora of points. Are you with me? A plethora. From your website, to the navigation, to the fonts, to the colors, to the people, to your personality, to your first impression, to your glasses, to your voice. And you talk like this, it's really annoying. And, you know, I'm not really sure if you do, but it's like you should be in Hollywood doing voiceovers because there's probably a job for you there to what you're saying. Do you know after 30 years, I don't have one disparaging word about myself on the internet, not one. I manage my brand. I manage my brand. And so there's a huge cost if you've got all these wild hairs running out there just being whatever they want to be, just free phone. No, you cannot. You need to go home and shut the door and be what you want to be. You know, you need to go to a different country with a different name to be what you want to be. Not with the internet now. One picture of you, and I know they are drinkers at IAEE. <laughs> These people know how to drink. And I say to them, take off your bloody badge if you're going to be drinking. People with cameras. <laughs> oh, and that's a special shot when you're married kissing on somebody who's not. I know how this rolls. All right, be careful of your damaged brand. There's lots of clutter and lots of cost there. Now, how much time do we have because we have a break? Do we need a break now? We have 30 minutes before our break. How are you guys feeling? Because if you have ADD or ADHD, you've already checked out about 100 times while I've been talking. 
You've already gone to your text and your thing. Richard's on his thing doing this. He's checking out his email. He's got it going on. He's kind of working in place, and I know, and you've traveled. So um, what would you like to do? Would you like to go a little bit more? Oh, we are. Okay, so keep talking, Kathleen. Okay, good. Okay. So do me a favor, though. Let's just get up for a minute. You know, uh, Tony always taught us about physiology. If you want to wake up, show up. You know what's really, really fun? There's a great gal. Her name is Amy Cuddy, and I got to speak with her at the city manager's meeting, uh, city manager, county managers, uh, last year in Boston. And she's a professor from Boston, and she talks about physiology and the science of this, this uh, stance. And there's a lot of science behind it, but I highly recommend it. And what you do, it's a power stance. So how many of you do presentations? How many of you do sales? How many of you want to raise? <laughs> Woohoo! Honest to God, send me an email. You start space clearing, you will get a raise. I guarantee you there's so much abundance, it's ridiculous. The first time I cleared, I got $6,000 raise. Honest to God, I did. I quit my job on the day that I did the space clearing. I did the space clearing, went to work, quit my job, and got a $6,000 raise for the six months that I was going to be there. I was in the car going back to my house, which is an hour away. I was in the uh, commuter lane. I was a lawbreaker. I didn't care. I was like, what else can I get rid of? I mean, it works. So this is called The Power Stand by Amy Cuddy. No, she's, go ahead, come on, everybody can do this. You too, Carl, yeah. Okay, there you go, good. Now, what happens with The Power Stand, I teach to all my clients. So if you're going in to speak, if you're going in to sell, if you're going in to get a raise, whatever have you, you want to do this. Now, what happens in this, there's a lot of science behind this. Now, you don't have to do this and do that or... You know, no, it's just, come on, keep it up. Now, it can start to hurt after a while too, right? You know what this does? It ups your testosterone and lowers your cortisol. The cortisol is the stress hormone. So if you walk out on that show floor after you've done the power stand, whoo, look at Richard. Now he's power standing and dancing. <laughs> Professor Richard. Now you can do that or you can do this. Put your hands on your hips. And all you have to do is stand there for two. Now, there is a whole science about you. How many of you are thinking this is bull crap right now? Raise your hand. Look at Carl. He's so honest. That is bull crap. He thinks I'm full of crap. He's even wondering why Richard hired me. And no. But what the good news is, is she's a professor at Harvard, Carl. And... There are studies that show it changes the physiology. It's amazing. So those of you that doubt me, go look at the TED Talk. Give it two minutes. But I tell you, I did it this morning. How many of you, um, well, you can do a small thing. Work with anxiety. Okay. Uh-huh. Anxiety or overwhelm. This takes you right out of it. So great. My stomach was in knots this morning. I just did my power pose for two minutes. I was like, I can hardly wait to get down there. <laughs> oh, yeah. What's your name? Now, this is another thing. You can sit at your desk in this pose. Yeah, because you're full of yourself. See? Yeah. I got a button for you. So shake it out, shake it out, shake it out, shake it out. You know, and you also want your rooms about 68 degrees or less because right now you're, no, because what happens is your brain shut off. They stop listening and they stop learning. Are you shaking it out? Some of you that aren't married don't shake very well and I know why you're single. Like, what the hell? <laughs> shoulders back, shoulders back, chest up. I wish we had some music. Come on, Devin, what do we got? We got the happy song. Hey, they, these are show people. They'll do almost anything. OK, do this. Right? We got some music. Can we crank it up? Why am I screaming? 
You know, it's so much fun. I remember it was the first keynote. It was in Seattle, Washington. And here I am as an admin. And I always thought, God, why did you make me an admin? Can you imagine my personality behind the desk? <laughs> Trying to be a secretary with ADD. I can't spell. My grammar sucks. And people with ADD, we don't like to sit in our chair. So I got to learn to sit in my chair 10 hours a day and it has served me very well going forward. So things can change over time. But I'll never forget, people throughout my whole life goes, inside voice. Anyone else get that? Anyone else loud? Inside voice. Just the matter, it's a, such a negative neural emotional response. When somebody does that to me, I just want to, ooh, use sign language. <laughs> I'm like, inside voice, inside voice. So I never forget being in Seattle, and the first thing I did, I stood on stage and I had the mic. I said, you know the most exciting thing about today is the fact that I get to talk for an entire hour, and nobody's going to tell me to shut up, and I don't have to use my inside voice. <laughs> it was great. Right. Now, we just covered a lot of eye-opening, mind-bending things that you might have not considered when it comes to organizational clutter. So basically, business clutter is any issue or challenge you have is clutter. Are you with me? It's that simple. You must understand what your issues and challenges are in order to create a solution for them. Now, let's look at the employee. This is personal, physical clutter. We're talking about you right now. You're the employee, unless you own the company. How many of you own your companies? OK, they all sit at the same table, I guess, except for you. Um, <laughs> fantastic. This is your employee clutter cost. Okay, let's look at these. There was an office study done in 2006 by Office Depot. Now, this is physical clutter. This is why it matters, people. These are studies. 76% report losing time to disorder. Do you think that's a lot? That's a lot. 61% can't find what they need quickly. How many of you experienced that? I know it's a small hand because you don't want to be known. This is a very personal topic. And let me tell you what, I was working with a city manager and we just kind of bumped into each other. It wasn't random. I don't believe that there are any coincidences. And I'm sitting down with him and he has so much pain as we're talking before my talk. And he says, you know, Kathleen, he goes, I used to be the CFO of this company and now I'm the city manager. He goes, I am mortified, horrified, embarrassed. I have so much guilt and shame is because nobody knows that it takes me sometimes an hour to find something. He goes, if they come into my office unexpected and they're looking for something, I'm always making up an excuse. So for those of you with this challenge, you just need to be really gentle with yourselves and have some kind of solution over time where you know where things are. Um, I have an address for everything, and I'm going to teach that a little bit later. You know, this is what I do. Everything I have is an address. Everything has an address. So when your kids come in the house and they dump all their crap in the middle of the living room, you just say, honey, is that the address? <laughs> well, that's the current address, mommy. <laughs> no, no, what's the official address to that back bag? It's in my room. What's the official address to that coat? It's on the coat check. What's the official address to your car keys? on the little ring, on the rooster in the kitchen. It's so automatic. I, I, I live with the least amount of frustration and stress that you can't even imagine, because everything has an address. Now, I'm menopausal, OK? I have short-term memory. And this one's going too much information for me right now. It's the, it's the fact of life here. We're talking about clutter. And I'll address something and then forget where the new address is. Any, anybody? That happen to anybody else? It's like, where in the hell is my new address? Jesus, Mary and Joseph, I tell you. OK, so another fact, 51% live in controlled chaos. How many of you live in controlled chaos? How's that working for you? You know what? You're going to be taken off about 10, 15 years of your lifespan. I tell you, and I'm serious about this, because stress is our number one disease in our world. Over all other diseases, it is the catapult of all disease, stress. Hmm. Now. 51% are concerned about missing important deadlines and appointments. And we're just working, 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 trying to stay on top of it. Boy, when you have clarity, you have so much peace. When everything has an address, 
Ha. Ah. Ha. Ah. Heaven. All right, what else is going on with cost? 27% find it hard to concentrate in a mess. There is a neuroscience from Princeton that I give you in these resources. Check it out. And they talk about clutter being, they talk about if you have a cluttered desk, it, 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 it diminishes your focus. And one other item that I've forgotten. But, oh, your ability to maintain and um, concentrate on a lot of new information coming in. So when you're working in clutter, they say it's like a nagging child when the baby's like, candy mommy, candy mommy, candy mommy, candy mommy, can I have some candy, 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 candy? So you can work for a while while this two-year-old's going candy, 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 candy. Same thing with clutter, it's like a two-year-old. It limits your focus and your ability to take in new information. It's a law, people, and I, I give it to you. I'm gonna give you something else here. 16% fear of diminishing their reputation. You know, it's interesting. All those people that we talked about earlier that have judgment about people with cluttered desk. If that person lives in a non-cluttered world and walks by your desk all the time, let me tell you what, you are not going to get a raise and you're not gonna get a promotion because they have all those false beliefs about you. We went through them. They think you're lazy, disorganized, you're gonna miss appointments. How in the hell are you gonna manage this business unit if you have all this clutter? Does that make sense? Okay. 14% lose business opportunities due to disorganization. I think it's a lot more. I work with a lot of people. I have a class called The Fortune is in the Follow-Up. Whew. So few people have a follow-up strategy that actually works. So I think that is a lot higher. I think you're leaving a lot of business on the table. Okay. And the last one. Now, 800 people were surveyed and the clutter affected this. I think you're on board with this. 77% of your productivity was affected. 63% your state of mind. 53% your motivation. 40% your happiness. 38% your professional image. 20% your relationships. <laughs> and you're out of order. Does everybody get that clutter is not a healthy thing? Do you get that now? Are you on board? Are you even interested in creating a space at your office where you can spend 15 minutes a day on getting rid of stuff or an hour a week? Are you on board with that? Can you see what clutter is doing to you? You are out of order, all of us. You know, we're, what kind of life are we actually living? You know, what is the real quality of our life with the businesses that we do? You know, I have arranged with my business owner, I said, you tell me the lifestyle you want to live and we'll work backwards. We doubled his business. He's on a three-month sabbatical. He's moving out of Ohio to Florida. They're moving. He's going to run the business from there. I cloned him, so I was able to clone him. So we have him working at the company. We hired a few more people. But then we were talking like, how can we grow the business from 1.7 million from two to four and do it easy and effortless? That's what I'm about. So I just move out the clutter. I ask different questions. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna put some salespeople possibly in California, New York, right, and Chicago, where they can get a buck and a quarter an hour in Ohio, but they can get 250 an hour in any of those cities for the same work, right? So it's a very simple solution to double the business without adding more clutter. Does that make sense? So we have to ask ourselves, I said ultimately, and you know, I've shed a lot of tears about this, ultimately when you clear the clutter out of your work and your life and your business, then you get to have more time with your family, your friends, and your children. They're starving. They're starving for you. And that's the ultimate goal, to really get on board with this. Because the winners are your children because they're gonna to learn to live in a different way and they're gonna be so supported because you're clearing. It's, it's a wonderful thing. So, 80% of your items that are stored in filing cabinets are stacked on your desk will never be read, seen, or dealt with. How many agree with that stat? How many of you continue to have stuff stacked? How many continue? Oh, how many of you have even looked at the file cabinet? The stuff has been in there for how long? How many years has that crap been in the file unit? But there's some little trigger of the mind, there's some little belief system that you're going to need it. Right? They're just in casers. We're going to talk about that. 
the just in casers. I swear to God, in November, I moved and I had my file cabinets moved and they were in storage for a few years. I don't like storage. I'm not a storage person. I put everything I loved and adored into storage. I moved from the Bay Area to LA and unfortunately I had some physical challenges. I broke my back three times and I spent almost four years in and out of bed recovering. So I didn't have the physicality to get my stuff out of storage to move it. So the stuff goes into storage. It goes from 170 a month to three something a month that I'm paying for it. Then it gets delivered to the house and it's sitting in there because it's, as an ADD person, filing is the last thing on the list that I enjoy doing. I'd rather have every tooth pulled out of my mouth <laughs> without Novocaine than file. Anyone else? Okay. So, finally in November, I used my own strategies and I went after the filing system. And what I do is I just chunk it down. I just did an hour a night. I just took it, I put my hands on every single piece of paper. I asked the question, do I need it? Do I need this? And can I find it anywhere else? So if I need it, I'm gonna keep it because I'm a visual girl, but can I find it on Google? Can I just Google this information, right? And I, I've taken these months and over time, but those files have opened up and a lot of other things have opened up for me too. So it's a trigger of the mind that you will ever look at that stuff. If you've not seen it in a year, get rid of it, people. Open up your creativity, open up your minds. Now, how much more time do we have? 13 minutes? About five more and then we're gonna be ready, okay. All right, I know this is a lot for everybody and you guys are doing great and I really appreciate your attention. Are, are you learning something? Is it making sense? Are you excited to get after your purses tonight when you get in back to your rooms? <laughs> dump them all out, I've got a strategy for you. You're gonna dump them all out. We're gonna learn it when you come back. So let's look at this. Clutter affects many areas of your business. Having clutter can, now if you agree, yell out yes. Can make you feel tired and lethargic can keep you from being highly productive, can stifle your creativity. Who's my no man? God, I love you, Bob. It can. And you're the one guy that it can. <laughs> There's always an exception to the rule, Bobby. No, there's always an exception to the rule. My way is not your way or the highway or the any way. Whatever works for you. Yeah. Yes, and we could debate that for the next two hours. And I appreciate your view. I honest do, Bobby. That's why I used to call my dad Bobby. Bobby baby, actually. Oh, really? Okay, Bob, we got it. <laughs> I think he needs a button. I'm so excited, ask me why. <laughs> um, having clutter can confuse you, is that a yes? yes. Can affect the way people treat you? Yes. Yeah. It can make you procrastinate. Hello, anybody for that? It can cause disharmony, stress, and frustration. Yes? Okay. It can affect you emotionally. We already talked about that, right? It can rob you of peace of mind. Your yeses are getting less, more active. Okay, good. Listen, we're in a revival here, people. It can depress you. Yes, it can depress me, Kathleen, I'm depressed. There you are. That is how you're feeling, but nobody knows it. You're hiding, except for Bob. <laughs> this is Bob going, I love my clutter. <laughs> I love Bob. OK, now what we're going to do is um, we're going to come back to this because you guys need a break because I don't want, you know, I love props. This is another thing you should bring to your board meetings. Have more fun. I love me some props. Okay, so Professor Kathleen is crazy about clutter. And um, so what you're gonna do right now on the sound of this, you are going to clear your assets off those seats 
and you get an entire half hour. Aren't you so excited? Ask me why. You get to clear your tweets and your Facebooks and your emails and your voicemails. You got a half hour to clear all that. You're going to get some substances. You're going to refresh. You're going to talk about your clutter. And what I want you to do is I want you to ask people what their number one clutter issue is and if you might have a solution for them, right? What's a tip or a trick? So what time do we want them back? We want you back in a half hour. So you're going to come back and everybody's going to be on time except for those that have ADD. They're going to be here about five minutes later. Um, it's 10 to 4, so you're going to come here at 420. Is that correct? 420. So everybody give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> Woo!